Praise the Lord, church. Amen. Is anyone else glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. I love what I feel in here today. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. And while you're turning there, I'd like to give honor to our awesome bishop and our pastoral staff. I'd like to give honor to Pastor Walters as well. And really quickly, uh, I want to give honor to one of my close friends. He's not in here right now. But today is David Johnson's birthday. So if you would, after church, go say happy birthday to him if you see him. Just want to put that out there. All right. And uh, if you missed camp meeting, you really missed out. Because camp meeting, one of the most powerful experiences I have ever been to it was awesome and we had a good time in the lord all right and the bible says as follows stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness you may be seated since paul was a roman citizen when he wrote this he was envisioning a roman soldier and taking into account the way the roman armor was set up It is interesting to note that the first piece of armor noted by Paul was the belt of truth. You know, usually if you compliment someone on their clothing, you know, you usually you'll say, hey, nice shirt, you know, nice shoes. Not, hey, nice belt. I mean, some people, they have a nice belt buckle or something, but, you know, I'm not, that's not the first item of clothing I'm looking at. I'm not saying, hey, you have a really nice belt going on or you really nice belt, but You know, why was it that Paul chose to talk about the belt first? You know, usually it's because he listed the thing that was most important first. You know, if we make lists, you know, we usually put the most important thing first. You know, if we have to get our car fixed, we're going to get our engine fixed before we get the stain on our seat, you know, removed. But for the Roman soldier, his whole armor was kept together by the belt. His shield hung off of his belt. His sword hung from the belt. His breastplate was strapped down by his belt. So what does that mean for us? Well, I'll tell you, it means the same exact thing. Our centerpiece is our belt, which is truth. If we don't have truth, our shield of faith will crumble and we will have nothing to hold on to. If we don't have truth, we will not have a place for our sword of the spirit to be carried and false doctrine will arise. If we don't have truth, our breastplate of righteousness and holiness will not have a foundation. We need to have truth. You know, the belt of truth, it doesn't just represent the word of God. That's why we have the sword of the spirit. It represents the word of God applied in our life. Not just the biblical verses of living holy, but living holy yourself. Mm, Can I get an amen on that one? Don't forget you are a living epistle known and read of all men. Truth and true doctrine must be the very thing that keeps us grounded. It says in Ephesians 4.14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. So the question is, what is true doctrine? What is our centerpiece? Well, Paul answers that question in just a few verses before. He says in Ephesians 4, 2, and 6, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Acts 2.38, holy living, one God, baptism in Jesus' name. That is our foundation. That is our truth. We cannot stray away from truth. But many of us know this, and the real question is, do you cherish it? Because in order for something to be the centerpiece of your life, you can't just have the knowledge of it. You must have the appreciation for it and cherish it. It goes like the old song, so I'll cherish 
the old rugged cross. So my trophies at last I laid down, and I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Many of us wonder why we have a hard time in our day-to-day -day life and why we're constantly fighting the same fights. And that's because we are still having debates in our mind that we should have settled long ago. Do you truly cherish the fact that you have revelation and truth? If you cherish this doctrine and this old rugged cross, if you have it truly as your centerpiece, then no matter what comes your way, nothing will be able to shake you. It says in Hebrews 12, 27 and 28, and this word, yet once more signifieth the removing of those things which are shaken and of those things which are made and those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But if the kingdom of God is inside of you, you will not be shaken no matter what comes your way. You need to look at your problems in the face, square back your shoulders, and declare you will not be moved because you stand on truth. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters. You see, the verse says, you know, I opened up, you know, that I opened with, it talked about, you know, it said, gird up your loins with the belt of truth. That phrase is pretty much an old-fashioned way of saying, steal your mind or something of that nature. We need to steal our mind with the word of God and with truth, not with the latest pop psychology and sociology. The world has plenty of that, and it's not serving them any, any well. When trials come, get in the word. It's the only thing that will keep you because there's a storm out on the ocean, and it's moving this old way. And if your soul's not anchored in Jesus, then you will surely drift away. Stop listening to the voices of the world and listen to the word. We don't have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology, sociology, and legality. It saved and delivered people from sin in the first century, and it saves and delivers people from sin in the 21st century. And if you need to be delivered, you can be delivered today. And by the way, if there's something in the Bible that you don't understand, that doesn't mean you just need to give up your faith and throw it all away. There's nothing wrong with the word of God. You need to understand it. You need to pray that God gives you understanding. See, when false doctrine comes your way and secularism comes, you need to realize, you know, you don't need to play dead. Act like you're in the minority. Don't forget Jesus and the disciples in the New Testament church. We're also in the minority. It says in Jude 1 and 3, it says to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. We need to always have a right spirit and be as gentle as doves and as wise as serpents. But there are times that you must earnestly contend for the faith. You know, and in closing, I just want to talk about this really quickly. Your salvation is not the only thing at risk. You see, you have two responsibilities. The first is to carry the torch that was passed on to you. But the second is to pass on the torch to the next generation if the Lord tarries. If you don't keep the faith, what type of legacy are you leaving behind for the people who look up to you? Whether it be your friends, your spouse, your children, or the people you are mentoring. As I stated, everyone's faith should be in truth. But some people's faith will be dependent if you pass it on. You know, it talks about in Timothy, you know, the unfeigned faith of Lois and Eunice in 2 Timothy 1 and 5. Timothy, Timothy's mother and grandmother. You know, they set that example of faith. You know, the same principle is true in my life. My great-great-grandmother on my mother's side was a Pentecostal holiness woman. Her name was Rachel Lee and my mom told me stories of her praying in the spirit. And I know that I am a living testimony because of the prayers of my great-great-grandmother. You know, 
This past week, we celebrated the past, or we honor the past, celebrated the present, and envisioned the future. You know, there is a harvest that we are going to reap because of what the elders gave to us and what they planted. And we need to carry it on. And in closing, I just want to talk about, are you going to carry it on? In 2 Timothy, Paul talked about he fought a good fight. He kept the faith. He finished the course. Joseph impacted his generations. Elijah impacted his generations. King David impacted his generations. And because of their faithfulness, God decided to use their generations. Your decisions today can be the deciding factor for the generations to come. So I conclude with this question. What will your legacy be? In Jesus' name, be blessed.